Okay, so today we're going over ecology, which is going to be chapters 34 and 36. Uh, all, all ecology is, is the study of living stuff with non-living stuff or their environment. So uh, biotic factors, bio meaning life or living things, biotic factors are going to involve all living organisms or living stuff. Abiotic factors, that's going to be non-living stuff. So non-living, a, bio, a, or non-bio, non-living stuff. So that's going to be things like temperature, rainfall, elevation. Okay, yeah, so climate variations, sunlight, substrate availability or nutrient availability, uh, water, air currents. So those are the kinds of things that we're talking about. When we're talking about abiotic factors. Oh yeah, usually we watch a video by Bill Nye um, at this point. Um, we're not going to watch it here. Just watch it. Watch it after lecture. It's only like three or four minutes or something, so it's it's really short. Um, and he does a way better job. Bill Nye does a way better job of explaining why the seasons even exist um, when. It, well, because he, he gives you a lot of visual examples. All I can do here really is just show you a static image and try to explain it with my hands, which I can't. Um, so our, the earth is usually tilted in, tilted in one direction and it rotates around the sun in that, in that same tilt. And so when, 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 when earth rotates one revolution, um, not around the sun, but just one rotation, we consider that to be a day, right? So one rotation is one day, and then one movement, one evolution, revolution around the sun, that's one year. And so because we, we maintain this tilt during some parts of the year, that tilt is closer to the sun. So this area is closer to the sun um, during some parts of the year. And then in other parts of the year, or like winter, this part is away from the sun. And so that's part of the reason why, you know, like in one side of the world, we would have summer while the other side is experiencing winter. Let's say this is, this is summer for this side of the world. And then over here, it's going to be winter because it's slightly tilted away from the sun. But like I said, Bill Nye does a much better job than me because he uses a lot of visual examples and he plays with a lot of toys and it's a, it's a much better job. So um, in short, just to summarize um, why we get seasons is because the Earth's tilt um, remains constant as it revolves around the sun. Okay, I usually don't focus too much on trade winds in general. Um, so I'm not going to test on it, but I do test on this. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so solar radiation increases with increased elevation. So as you get, as you, as you move to higher elevations, you're, you're actually higher in altitude. Therefore you're in a sense closer to the sun, right? So as you get higher, you're actually going to receive more uh, solar radiation. Now, what happens is, and I guess this kind of can go towards, can, can kind of hint towards trade winds, but let's say you're on the coast and usually, like let's, we could use, even use California as an example. Um, we have the, the coast of California and then inland, you have the Sierra Nevada where you have a very mountainous region. Now, if we know that when, when heat radiates water, water heats up, water evaporates, so you get a lot of buildup of clouds um, around your coastal regions or just, you know, in, you know, over, over like the ocean surface, essentially. And when you get winds that blow those clouds, which is just condensed um, or, or not condensed water uh, towards the inland, what happens is they're not elevated um, high enough to go to pass over the mountains. And what happens is as they start reaching the mountains, you get a lot of rainfall. And then on the other side of that, because those 
that that water that had evaporated from the ocean wasn't able to pass through the mountains, what you get is a very arid area on the inside. That's why central California is very dry and desert-like. And the coastal region is like perfect temperature, perfect amount of rainfall, perfect amount of moisture. And so that, that whole concept, we call that the rain shadow effect. So that's where you get rainfall on one side on the on the um, the the region facing the ocean, and then you get an arid side on the other on the other side of the mountains. So rain shadow effect. Okay, so this is going to reference back to our first week of class, the hierarchy of interactions. So instead of going from, starting from cells or starting from chemicals, uh, we'll just start at the organismal level. So we have organisms, so this is going to be one individual in a particular location. So this is one duck. And then as soon as you start talking about this duck with other ducks of the same species, so same species, now we're talking about uh, population. So before we even start talking about other species, just one population of duck, we're talking about population, just duck, one species. And then when you start talking about, let's say, duck, ducks and geese, now we're talking about a community because now you've introduced another, um, another type of organism or another species into the mix. Now when you start talking about the geese and the duck in a cold environment that's mountainous with X amount of rainfall, now you're talking about an ecosystem. So an ecosystem includes all species as well as all abiotic factors. So the habitat would be the abiotic factors. And then we know the biosphere uh, is just another term that could be used, be used synony synonymously with the earth, the biosphere. Okay. All right. So we're going to be talking about quite a few biomes today. Um, 75% of the Earth's surface is aquatic, and then the rest is terrestrial. So when we're talking about the aquatic biomes or the ocean, um, I think I mentioned this in the first, during the first week or first two weeks, that the, the, the biggest contributors to oxygen on Earth are phytoplankton. So these things will hang out along usually uh, coastal regions and they just chill out in water. They're photosynthesizers. And so you've got trillions of photosynthesizers photosynthesizing and releasing their oxygen um, out into the atmosphere. So a lot of times people will think, you know, it's the tropical rainforest that contributes the most oxygen. It's actually phytoplankton from the um, aquatic biomes. Because if you think about it, if the Earth's surface is 75% aquatic, these are the photosynthesizers that are going to predominate all of the aquatic biomes. So just simply, just numbers, through numbers, 75% of the Earth's surface containing phytoplankton are probably going to contribute more oxygen than the maybe 10% of, you know, the tropical rainforest. So just with sheer volume, you've got way more surface area on Earth that is aquatic containing phytoplankton. So they don't get enough, um, they don't get enough glory. Tropical rainforest gets all of the, all of the glory. One thing about the tropical rainforest though, is that it has the highest amount of biodiversity. Okay. So that's, that's just a brief overview of, of the, um, yeah, aquatic biomes. Um, so, now let's talk about fresh water. So fresh water is only about 1%. So that means that the, the, other, the other percent or the other 99% of what is aquatic will not be fresh water. And so we, we usually categorize this into three different categories. We have standing water. So this is just water where you're not really getting too much. Um, it's not moving. It's still. So I know that at Fort Stillicum, we've got like a lake. Is it, do we consider that a lake? I think that's a lake. There's a, there's a lake, I forget the name of the lake, but there's a lake there. Um, and it's, it's still, usually the water will, it will be stagnant. And then we have flowing water. So these are gonna be like rivers and streams. Um, usually the, the water in moving 
So if you're talking about like a flowing water biome, like a river, the water is going to be a lot clearer because all of the muck uh, actually just moves down to the bottom to where there's wetlands. So usually your, your predators that hang out, like let's say your, your uh, predatorial fish, they're going to use their vision to be able to catch their, their stuff. Now, when you're talking about uh, wetlands, uh, you're going to typically find things that are going to use, because like I said, all the muck runs off into the wetlands or the marshes or the swamps, they're going to actually use their sense of, of smell to catch their prey. So here's, you have an example of a catfish, which uses a sense of smell and less of its sense of vision to catch its prey. Now, when we're talking about, so these, this is all freshwater. These are the three categories of freshwater. And now we've got marine. So marine just implies that it's a saltwater environment. So your deep sea waters, um, those are going to be deeper below the surface. And so light can only penetrate so deep into water. There's particulates floating around in water. And so, I mean, you could only really make it so far down. And at the point where, we're, where it's completely black, you're going to have things living there like anglerfish, which actually use a fluorescent bacteria and its little um, its angle and what it does is it bioluminesces and it attracts um, its prey and then it just eats it another thing about deep deep sea waters is you actually have a lot of predators that will hang out that are adapted to low light um, areas and so what they'll do is during nighttime um, you have your open sea surface fish, let's just say, you know, your, your, um, I don't know, barracuda are a little bit less, um, deep sea, more open sea. They're not necessarily adapted to see in, uh, darker light. So at night, all they've got is moonlight. And what will happen is your deep sea predators will come up to the surface, eat them at night. And then when it's daytime, they'll swim back down to the bottom where they can kind of shroud themselves in darkness. Um, so deep sea waters, you're going to have things adapted to low light. Um, open sea surface, you're going to find things like this is where your dolphins are going to hang out. This is where your sea turtles are going to hang out. And then your shallow waters, you're, that's where you're going to find your coral reefs. And then we also have intertidal regions. So these are kind of these intermediate regions where sometimes they're going to be exposed to air. And then sometimes when the, when the tide is higher, they're going to be completely submerged underwater. So the types of organisms that are going to live here, like starfish, for example, um, they're adapted to, to live where they're completely exposed to air, and they're, they could also live completely submerged underwater. And so they'll usually anchor themselves onto things um, because usually the, the current's a lot stronger um, around coastal regions. And then we have another, another type of um, water biome or, or aquatic biome called the estuary. And that's the transition of freshwater to seawater. And so let's say you have like a river here and you've got, you know, marine, um, a marine biome over here, your estuary would be the transition area between them. So you're not going to have, um, it's not going to be fully freshwater. It's not going to be fully saltwater. And so you're going to have organisms there that are adapted to you know, minimal, um, you could say mineral concentration in the water or minimal, minimal solute, but not completely absent. All right, now onto the terrestrial biomes. This is the longest, we talk the most about this, even though this is like, you know, the, the majority of the, the, the surface of, the, of earth is, you know, aquatic, but we live on terrestrial biomes, so. I guess we're kind of, uh, what is it, species-centric. Okay, so um, our terrestrial biomes, we're going to usually group these based on vegetation type. Um, so not all of, it's not, it's not necessarily hard and fast rules for all of these. Typically, you're going to find your tropical rainforests around the equator, but you could actually get uh, rainforest-like symptoms, rainforest-like um, vegetation elsewhere too. So these are these aren't necessarily uh, hard hard and fast rules. 
So the first thing we're going to talk about, our first biome, terrestrial biome we're going to talk about is the tropical rainforest. And like I said, it gets a lot of, it has a high reputation for being a major contributor of oxygen, which it is. It is a major contributor of oxygen. But the most important thing to remember about the tropical rainforest is that it has the highest amount of biodiversity on Earth. Remember your phytoplankton in your aquatic biomes, those are going to contribute mostly to, or contribute to most of the oxygen on Earth, whereas the tropical rainforest, they have the highest amount of biodiversity. They're also going to have very high rainfall, which, which we probably learned that um, early in our education. High rainfall, lots of biodiversity. And by biodiversity, I just mean lots of different species. You've got lots of different genuses, species of lots of different things there that we haven't even discovered. Okay, so usually just outside of the equator, you have this, it's a little bit of a drier region, a little bit more of an open region. We call that the savanna. And so this is, this is where you kind of have, I mean, it's, it's just on the outskirts of the, of the rainforest, but it's going to mostly look like grassland. You see, it's, th there's just like this long stretch of prairie, but, but the thing is you'll see sparsely separated trees. So you're going to have some scattered trees around the savanna. That's the main differential or one of the differentials between this and grassland. So you're going to have sparsely um, placed trees. And then another big one is, well, you're going to have the biggest or the largest herbivores on earth that live in your savanna. So that's where you're going to see your elephants. That's where you're going to see your giraffes. The biggest herbivores will live in your savanna. And then they get seasonal rainfall. So tropical rainforests, they're going to get rainfall year round. Savannah is going to get rainfall in accordance with the seasons. So savannah, scattered trees, and the largest herbivores on earth. Though we really haven't explored much of the ocean and you might have some, you know, deep sea creatures that are giant that are herbivores. Herbivores meaning they just eat photosynthesizers. So, Okay, so outside of your savanna, we have the desert, and we know that the desert, you know, we, we watched Aladdin uh, from Disney, so desert is dry and uh, sandy, not very much vegetation at all whatsoever, but you do have vegetation, so you have things like cacti, and um, most of the organisms that live there will have, obviously, they, they should have adaptations for their hot climate. So one thing, that cam one thing that camels do, we know that it's really hot and dry there, so they have to conserve a lot of their water. Um, does, they don't necessarily conserve their water in their humps. That's actually fat that they store in their humps. Um, but when they're, when they're sleeping, they usually lay down, but they don't actually lay down all the way. They actually keep themselves elevated by crisscrossing their legs to increase um, airflow through underneath them. So they're like elevated when they, when they go to sleep. Another thing that they do that's pretty cool is they will face the sun. So when, when, you know, if you're in the desert and the sun is beating down on you instead of, so your camels are, you know, they're, they're wider, I guess they're, they're longer than they are wide. So if you had, if they had their sides facing the sun, so let's say you guys are the sun and they're this wide, if if they were showing their profile to the sun more surface area on their body would be exposed to the sun so they would actually heat up more so what they do is they'll face the sun so that less of their body is actually making direct contact with the sun and then also their hooves um, because we know in the desert there's a lot of sand it's kind of hard to walk in sand and so they're they have these kind of like built-in snowshoes in a sense where where they're they're firm but when they when they when they put, when they place their foot down, it expands kind of like jello. So camels are cool and then cacti just do cacti stuff, cactus stuff. Okay, now we've got the chaparral. So this is going to be even further from the equator. Uh, one example of a chaparral would be uh, Napa Valley in California. One thing about uh, chaparral environments is um, this is a this is a great area to grow grapes, and so if you notice, we know that a lot of great wine uh, comes from Italy, and so you'll see, or actually just 
we could just say this this area of the world, this is where a lot of the wine comes from. Well, it's because grapes grow really great there. Same with Napa Valley in California. And so they're typically going to be coastal. They'll have uh, kind of salty soil and then seasonal fire and spiny shrubs. So salty soil can grow grapes very well. That's the chaparral. And then we, now we have temperate grasslands. So um, we talked about the savanna. You have sparsely placed trees. Your grasslands in general are just going to be long stretches of just pure grassland. So these are going to be things like your flyover states uh, in the United States. So central, uh, the central area of the United States. You know, no one ever visits there. They just, they just fly over from coast to coast. But here you're going to have, um, this is where your, your agriculture will be, will pretty much predominate these areas. Um, you'll have sheep, wild horses too. There are wild horses that still exist, which is kind of cool. They're not all domesticated. All right. Now we have temperate broadleaf forests. So that was, that was temperate grasslands. Remember, the difference between temperate grasslands and savannas are you're, you're going to have the largest herbivores on earth in your savannas. Also, you're going to have sparsely placed trees in your savannas, whereas your temperate grasslands are just going to be purely grassland. All right, broadleaf forest. Uh, we have quite a bit of that in Washington. Um, this is where you'll see, and actually also uh, a little bit in uh, the central part of, of the US. Um, but this is where you're gonna have your deciduous trees. So by deciduous, I mean leaves that will change colors with the seasons and fall off seasonally. So your broadleaf trees. So. Um, usually, usually my 160 class, we, we do walks around the lake. I, I, I don't know the name of the lake, but we always walk around the lake and uh, we could pick out the different types of trees. You have the evergreen trees, which will have these spiny, spiny leaves, and then your deciduous trees, which are the leaves that fall off seasonally. Those are going to be broad leaves. So things like your maple trees and stuff like that. So here you're going to find deer, beavers, raccoons, songbirds. This is classic. Uh, forest when we think a uh, forest maybe maybe not I don't know if you're like northern European then you're probably thinking coniferous forest so coniferous forest um, the way I like to remember coniferous forest is con as kind of sounds like cone and the trees that you'll find in coniferous forests are going to be shaped like cones so Christmas trees and they're gonna have these spiny leaves um, also known as evergreen trees because they're going to stay green year-round. They're not going to lose their leaves year-round, and they're going to stay green as well. So coniferous trees are going to be shaped like cones. So in your coniferous forest, you're probably going to find a lot of uh, coniferous trees or cone-shaped trees. And then if you go even further north, um, what happens is you're going to still have a lot of life. You're still going to have a ton of coniferous trees uh, in your coniferous forest, but you're going to have very little biodiversity. So they're all going to be the same species of tree, just long stretches of the exact same species of tree through coniferous forest, usually. And we call that the taiga, taiga, when you get further north, and it's kind of a subcategory of coniferous forest. So largest ecosystem, because it's a large stretch of land with the same climate and the same um, type of vegetation, but very little by diversity. All right, as we get further north, we hit the tundra. So this is now we're getting cold. And usually this is this is somewhere where you'll get something called permafrost. And so permafrost is where you get this you get water that mixes with your with your dirt and it's so cold that it freezes that water into the dirt and well we call it it's permanently frozen soil and so if you think about it if you have water mixed with dirt and it's permanently frozen the plants that grow there well they won't be able to dig they dig their roots into the soil very well and so what you're mostly going to find are shorter shrubs that kind of stretch out through the area. So this is kind of like the grassland of the colder regions. 
You're not going to find trees that dig themselves deep, uh, dig their roots deep and sprout up really high. You're just going to find small shrubs. This is a lemming here. So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have things like lemmings, snow foxes, snow owls, and then oxen as well. So larger grazers. So there are there is still vegetation, um, but just not. It's not. They're not tall things. And then as you get to the very very peaks, so either the North Pole or the South Pole, then you're at your polarized cap. So these are kind of like the, the desert the desert of the colder climate. So this is kind of like the. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, polarized caps. So this is a, this, we consider this to be a cold desert. Um, there in your North pole, you're going to find your polar bears and then your South pole, that's where you'll find your penguins. So they usually are separated, uh, by region. Another thing that'll grow here are something usually we'll, we could find these when we walk around the lake. Um, they're called lichens. Um, and what it is, is actually a symbiotic relationship. Or mutualistic relationship between uh, fungi and um, algae. So algae photosynthesize. That's where you're going to get the green from. And then lichens. Well, they're a type of fungi. Which you know, usually when we think of fungi, we think of like mushrooms. So think of like that hard, like that kind of hard, rough surface covering, like a transparent um, fungi covering a bunch of algae. What happens is the the fungi provide a protective barrier for the algae. Usually algae like to live in more moist and a lot more temperate environments, but when they have this coating of fungi around them, well, then they can, they can still strive. <clears throat> and what they're doing, so what the algae are doing is they're providing sugars for the, for the fungi and the fungi is providing a protective coating. And so you're going to usually find lichens, you're going to find lichens um, in most environments, actually, um, but you're also going to find it in your polar ice caps. That's another thing that deer really like to graze on as well is, is lichens. You're going to find this in uh, your coniferous forests, also your broadleaf forests as well. But because there's, you know, living things are so sparse in the polar ice caps, this is going to be the type of vegetation you're going to find. Okay. So now we're done with looking at ecosystems or yeah, ecosystems. And we're going to look at population ecology. So these are, these are a few simple concepts. So, um, three things that, uh, population ecologists will typically study are population size. And these are kind of intuitive. They're kind of built into the words population size. I'm asking about population size. Then I'm asking about the number of individuals in the population. So if I'm talking about like, you know, Tacoma, what is the population size of humans? We're just going to count all the humans and be like, this is the population size. Now, if I'm talking about population density, and this is usually easier to, to ask the question regarding plants because humans are kind of mobile and they walk around and they drive around and, you know, we don't really stay in one spot. Um, that's going to be the number of individuals in an area. So plants, it's really easy to apply this to because plants aren't getting up and walking around. So population density that's going to be the the amount of organisms per area so that, essentially that's what what density is things per area how dense dense it dense is it and then we have lastly dispersal patterns so that's the going to be the way individuals are spaced in an area and like like population density plants are probably the easiest um uh, or or type of organism to ask uh, about dispersal patterns. And so you can have clumped. So let's say, you know, like your type of flower that likes to be around, um, you know, the same, you know, your same species, maybe they have some kind of mutualistic uh, benefit to each other. Um, you might be clumped or uniform. So evenly dispersed, maybe they compete for resources. And so you don't want to be too close to your, your brethren or just random, just random. So that's dispersal patterns. Like I said, they're all kind of built into the words. You know, if I ask you for population size, you're just going to tell me the number of organisms, population density, you're going to tell me the amount of organisms in an area and then dispersal patterns. How are you dispersed? Are you clumped, uniform, random? And those are just three different examples, but not all of the examples of dispersal patterns. Okay. So now when we're talking about population growth, 
Um, usually when you think of exponential growth, you might think of, you know, bacterial growth. Usually bacteria um, have, if they're given, you know, unlimited resources, they'll grow exponentially. And so, um, you, you know, if you, if you drink, if you drink your milk, um, like day one of becoming, you know, sour, um, you might not get very sick, but even, but like day two or day three, because of the exponential growth, you might get really sick drinking a gallon of sour milk on day three. <clears throat> so exponential growth, that's going to indicate unlimited resources and no restrictions on its ability to grow. And so let's just say you have like a very large Petri dish uh, that you just do, you put some bacteria on it and you let it grow. You might see something like exponential growth because usually Petri dishes, um, well, if you're growing it on a medium with abundant resources, there's no bearing to, to their, to their expansion in terms of um, space or resources, then you're going to see an exponential growth. Now, if there is some kind of limitation, so let's just say you have a very small Petri dish, what's going to happen is you're going to see a logistic growth. And that's because there's something that limits, that limits them. And in that case, if it's a small Petri dish, then you're not going to see you're, they're going to reach their carrying capacity. So they're going to be blocked by the, the um, space limitations. Same thing would go, let's say you have a Petri dish and you, you do a bacterial smear and um, you, you, know, you're, you put them in a medium with very limited resources. Well, they're still going to hit a carrying capacity because they're going to be competing for resources. And so they're going to, they're going to grow in a logistic way. They're going to grow until they hit a carrying capacity. And so what I mean by carrying capacity is the maximum population an area can sustain. So most organisms will all have some kind of carrying capacity given whatever space restriction you give them. So, you know, like we, let's say we have, you know, a few hundred people living, you know, in this neighborhood, but we wouldn't be able to have a million people living like in, in a single neighborhood, for example. Like, but there wouldn't be any room. So at some point we would reach carrying capacity for the environment. So all carrying capacity is the maximum population an area can sustain. And that's it.